Welcome students. I am Nancy Sutherland. I'm eager to begin the discussion of Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is entitled Learning and Memory. Chapter 6 focuses on the way we mentally store information we perceive and how it adds to our existing knowledge about the world during the learning process. We will discuss the following learning objectives in Chapter 6. It's important for marketers to understand how consumers learn about products and services. Conditioning results in learning. Learned associations can generalize to other things and why this is important to marketers. There is a difference between classical and instrumental conditioning. We learn by observing others' behavior. Our brains process information about brands to retain them in memory. The other products we associate with an individual product influence how we will remember it. Marketers measure our memories about products. Products help us to retrieve memories from our past. Learning Objective 1 states that it is important to understand how consumers learn about products and services. Learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior caused by experience. The experience can be direct or it can be observed. Learning is an ongoing process. A consumer can learn from direct experience or vicariously by observing events that affect others. This young man is pouring himself out in the learning process. There are several learning theories, which range from those that focus on connections between actions and consequences to those that focus on understanding complex relationships and problem solving. Thus, behavioral learning theories focus on stimulus response connections. Cognitive theories focus on consumers as problem solvers who learn when they observe relationships. Again, students' behavior learning theories focus on stimulus response connections. Further, behavioral learning theories assume that learning takes place as the result of responses to external events. Psychologists who subscribe to this viewpoint do not focus on internal thought processes. Instead, they approach the mind as a black box and emphasize the observable aspects of behavior. The observable aspects consists of things that go into the box, the stimuli or events perceived from the outside world, and things that come out of the box the responses or reaction to these stimuli. If you will remember my thoughts are that we should be very purposefully intentional to use our cognitive thought processes. There are two theories which are types of behavioral learning theories, classical conditioning and instrumental conditioning. Classical conditioning is when a stimulus that elicits a response is paired with another stimulus that initially does not elicit a response on its own. Instrumental conditioning is further also called operant conditioning. The individual learns to perform behaviors that produce positive outcomes and to avoid those that yield negative outcomes. It means thus to condition behavior using consequences. Instrumental conditioning refers to voluntary behaviors, while classical conditioning works to condition responses to involuntary behaviors. We'll cover more about classical conditioning on the next slide. Classical conditioning occurs when a stimulus that elicits a response 
is paired with another stimulus that initially does not elicit a response on its own. Over time, the second stimulus causes a similar response because we associate it with the first stimulus. Ivan Pavlov, a Russian physiologist who conducted research on digestion in animals, first demonstrated this phenomenon in dogs. He paired a neutral stimulus, a bell, with a stimulus known to cause a salivation response in dogs. The meat powder was an unconditioned stimulus because it was naturally capable of causing the response. Over time, the bell became a conditioned stimulus. The bell did not initially cause salivation, but the dogs learned to associate the bell with the meat powder and began to salivate at the sound of the bell only. The drooling of these canine consumers because of a sound was a conditioned response. Conditioning effects are more likely to occur after the conditioned and unconditioned stimuli have been paired a number of times. This effect is known as repetition. Stimuli similar to a conditioned stimulus may evoke similar responses. This is known as stimulus generalization. Conditions may also weaken over time, especially when an unconditioned stimuli does not follow a stimulus similar to a conditioned stimuli. This is called stimulus discrimination. I would like for us to engage in reflection. How might classical conditioning operate for a consumer who visits a new tutoring website and is greeted by the website's avatar who resembles Albert Einstein? Learning Objective 3 states that learned associations with brands generalize to other products. We can utilize these associations in marketing applications through repetition, conditioned product associations, and stimulus generalizations. Thus, behavioral learning principles apply to many consumer phenomena, such as creating a distinctive brand image or linking a product to an underlying need. Therefore, the transfer of meaning from an unconditioned stimulus to a conditioned stimulus explains why made-up brand names such as Marlboro, Coca-Cola, or Reebok exert such powerful effects on consumers. The association between the Marlboro man and the cigarette is so strong that in some cases, the company no longer even bothers to include the brand name in its ads that feature the cowboy riding off into the sunset. Conditioning effects are more likely to occur after the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus have been paired several times. Repeated exposures to the association increase the strength of the associations and prevent decay of these associations in memory. Many classic advertising campaigns consist of product slogans repeated often to enhance recall. The Rolaids campaign, which asks, how do you spell relief? Rolaids is a personal favorite. But for this to work, the unconditioned stimulus must repeatedly be paired with a conditioned stimulus. Otherwise, extinction occurs. Extinction means that the association is forgotten. Even when associations are established, too much exposure can turn negative. In that case, the association may change in terms of whether it is perceived as positive or negative. That's what happened to Izod when its logo became too exposed on a variety of clothing and products. The process of stimulus generalization is critical to branding 
and packaging decisions that try to capitalize on consumers' positive associations with an existing brand or company name. Marketers can base some strategies on stimulus generalization. Family branding enables products to capitalize on the reputation of a company name. Marketers can use product line extensions by adding related products to an established brand. Licensing allows companies to rent well-known names. Distinctive packaging designs create strong associations with a particular brand. Companies that make generic or private label brands and want to communicate a quality image often exploit this linkage when they put their products in similar packages to those of popular brands. Let us take time to engage in reflection, thereby increasing learning. Some advertisers use well-known songs to promote their products. They often pay more for the song than for the original compositions. How do you react when one of your favorite songs turns up in a commercial? Why do advertisers do this? How does it relate to learning theory? Instrumental conditioning, or operant conditioning, occurs when we learn to perform behaviors that produce positive outcomes and avoid those that yield negative outcomes. We associate this learning process with the psychologist B.F. Skinner, who demonstrated the effects of instrumental conditioning by teaching pigeons and other animals to dance and perform other activities when he systematically rewarded them for desired behaviors. Responses to classical conditioning are fairly simple and involuntary, but the responses we make to instrumental conditioning are related to obtaining a goal. We may learn the desired behavior over a period of time, as a shaping process rewards our intermediate actions. One way that instrumental conditioning may occur is through positive reinforcement. This is illustrated in the ad shown in the slide. Instrumental conditioning, or operant conditioning, occurs when we learn to perform behaviors that produce positive outcomes and avoid those that yield negative outcomes. Whereas responses in classical conditioning are involuntary and fairly simple, we make those in instrumental conditioning deliberately to obtain a goal. We may learn the desired behavior over a period of time as a shaping process rewards our intermediate actions. Instrumental conditioning occurs in one of three ways, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and punishment. Positive reinforcement comes in the form of a reward. Negative reinforcement shows how a negative outcome can be avoided. Punishment occurs when unpleasant events follow a response. Extinction occurs when there is no reinforcement. In other words, the conditioning is not activated because it is not reinforced. This figure will help to reinforce the relationships among these four conditions. In addition to deciding whether to use positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, or punishment, marketers also have to decide on a schedule. Marketers need to determine the most effective reinforcement schedule to use because this decision relates to the amount of effort and resources they must devote when they reward consumers who respond as they hope to their request. Several schedules are possible. In a fixed interval reinforcement, the first response made brings a reward, and then on a specific set interval, future rewards are given. 
with variable interval reinforcement, one doesn't know when the reward will be offered. Because you don't know exactly when to expect the reinforcement, you have to respond at a consistent rate. In a fixed ratio reinforcement, reinforcement only occurs after a fixed number of responses. The last type of reinforcement schedule is the variable ratio schedule. This is the type of schedule used by slot machines. Students let us engage in reflection. What kind of reinforcement is being used when stores offer loyalty programs? Provide several examples and identify the reinforcement approach being used. Learning Objective 5 states that we learn about products by observing others' behavior. Observational learning occurs when we watch the action of others and note the reinforcements they receive for the behaviors. In these situations, learning occurs as a result of vicarious rather than direct experience. People store these observations in memories as they accumulate knowledge and then they use this information at a later point to guide their own behavior. Modeling is the process of imitating the behavior of others. In the figure illustrated, you can see that for a marketer to instigate observational learning, four conditions must be met. First, the consumer's attention must be directed to the appropriate model and that person must be someone that the consumer wishes to emulate. Second, the consumer must remember what the model says or does. Third, the consumer must convert this information into action. Fourth, the consumer must be motivated to perform these actions. I find this graph absolutely intriguing as it identifies that a consumer is born and children start accompanying their parents in the marketplace as early as one month old. The process of consumer socialization begins with infants. Within the first two years, children request products they want. By about age five, most kids make purchases with the help of parents and grandparents. This figure shows the sequence of stages as kids turn into consumers. Parents exhibit different styles when they socialize their children. They may be authoritarian, neglecting, or indulgent. Authoritarian parents are hostile, restrictive, and emotionally uninvolved. Neglecting parents are detached from their children and don't exercise much control over what the children do. Indulgent parents communicate more with their children about consumption-related matters and are less restrictive. Let us do another reflection exercise. How did your parents influence your development as a consumer? How much freedom were you provided in terms of your consumer choices? Learning Objective 6 states our brains process information about brands to retain them in memory. Memory is a process of acquiring information and storing it over time so that it will be available when we need it. Many people assume the mind works with an information processing approach. Data are input, processed, and output for later use in revised form. In the encoding stage, information enters in a way the system will recognize. In the storage stage, 
We integrate this knowledge with what is already in memory and warehouse it until it is needed. During retrieval, we access the desired information. Figure 3.3 summarizes the memory process. According to the information processing perspective, there are three distinct memory systems. Sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Each plays a role in processing brand-related information, as summarized in the figure. Sensory memory stores the information we receive from our senses. This storage is temporary. If the information is retained for further processing, it passes through an intentional gate and transfers to short-term memory. Short-term memory also stores information for a limited period of time and it has limited capacity. This system is working memory. It holds information we are currently processing. Our memories can store verbal input acoustically or somatically. We store this information by combining small pieces into larger ones in a process we call chunking. A chunk is a configuration that is familiar and the person can think about it as a unit. Long-term memory is the system that allows us to retain information for a long period of time. A cognitive process we call elaborative rehearsal allows information to move from short-term memory to long-term memory. As we engage in a reflection exercise, I would like us to meditate upon these questions. What's a memory that you just can't seem to forget? Bonus, if you think of one related to a brand. Now that you know the types of memory and how your mind stores information, why do you think the memory stays with you? Learning Objective 7 states the other products we associate with an individual product influence how we will remember it. Recent research suggests that long-term memory and short-term memory are interdependent systems. Depending on the nature of processing task, different levels of processing occur that activate some aspects of memory rather than others. These approaches are called activation models of memory. The more effort it takes to process information, the more likely it is that the information will transfer into long-term memory. According to these activation models of memory, an incoming piece of information gets stored in an associative network that contains many bits of information. These storage units are knowledge structures like a complex spider web filled with pieces of data. Incoming information gets put into nodes that connect one to another. Figure 3.6 shows an associative network for perfumes. A marketing message may activate our memory of a brand directly or indirectly. If it activates a node, it will also activate other linked nodes, much as tapping a spider's web in one spot sends movement reverberating across the web. The process of spreading activation allows us to ship back and forth among levels of meaning. The way we store a piece of information in memory depends on the type of meaning we initially assign to it. This meaning type then determines how and when something activates the meaning. 
the meaning types are listed in the slide. Brand specific meaning refers to memory stored in terms of the claims the brand makes. Ad specific meaning refers to memory stored in terms of the medium or content of the ad itself. Brand identification is memory stored in terms of the brand name. Product category meaning is memory stored in terms of how the product works or where it should be used. Evaluative reactions is memory stored as positive or negative emotions. Further within a knowledge structure, we code elements at different levels of abstraction and complexity. Meaning concepts like macho get stored as individual nodes. We may combine these concepts into a larger unit we call a proposition or belief. A proposition links two nodes together to form a more complex meaning. For example, Axis Cologne for Macho Men is a proposition. One type of schema that is especially relevant to consumer behavior is a script. A script is a sequence of events an individual expects to occur. Students, let us engage in reflection. Identify a script you expect when you use a specific product. Did your script facilitate or limit marketing objectives? Learning Objective 8 states marketers measure our memories about products and ads. How do we know if our marketing messages are designed to help consumers remember them? We can measure recognition and recall. In a typical recognition test, researchers show ads to subject one at a time and ask if they've seen them before. In contrast, free recall tests ask consumers to independently think of what they've seen without being prompted first. Of course, measures of memory can be faulty. For one, they may be contaminated by response bias. For example, people tend to give yes responses to questions regardless of the question. People also suffer from memory lapses. Typical problems include omitting facts, averaging or normalizing the memories by not reporting extreme cases, and telescoping inaccurate recall of time. The illusion or truth effect may occur as well. This effect refers to the phenomenon of people remembering a claim is true when they've been told the claim is false. Nostalgia describes the emotions where we view the past with longing. We reference the good old days. When marketers play on nostalgia, they want us to attach our farm memories to new products. One way to do this is to introduce retro brands. A retro brand is an updated version of a brand from a prior historical period. The Mini Cooper, P2 Cruiser, and Volkswagen New Beetle are all retro brands. Learning Objective 9 states products help us to retrieve memories from our past. Retrieval is the process whereby we recover information from long-term memory. Many things affect our ability to retrieve information. One of those is how the marketer presents the information. Early memory theorists thought that memories just faded with time. This is known as decay. Forgetting can also occur as a result of interference. Consumers may forget stimulus response associations if they subsequently learn new responses to the same or similar stimuli. 
This is called retroactive interference. When prior learning interferes with new learning, this is called proactive interference. It is important for marketers to understand what can help us to remember so that messages can be planned appropriately. The process called state-dependent retrieval means that we are better able to access information if our internal state is the same at the time of recall as when we learned the information. Familiarity and recall states that we are more likely to recall messages about items we are already familiar with. The salience of a brand refers to its prominence or level of activation in memory. Also, any technique that increases the novelty of a stimulus also improves recall. This result is called the von Restoreff effect. This explains why unusual advertising or distinctive packaging tends to facilitate brain recall. The intensity and type of emotions we experience at the time also affect the way we recall the event. We recall mixed emotions differently than unipolar emotions. Unipolar emotions become even more polarized over time. That means that good things seem even better and bad things even worse. The viewing context our ability to remember. That's why some marketers have begun to utilize hybrid ads. Hybrid ads have some kind of program tie-in to relate the commercial to the programming show. Students, as we engage in reflection, let us meditate. List three of your favorite foods. What memories do you have associated with these foods? Are the foods associated with specific family events, like a gathering for St. Patrick's Day? For further reflection, what retro brands are targeted to you? Were these brands that were once used by your parents? What newer brands focus on nostalgia, even though they never existed before? As we enter the end of the lecture, let us keep these pertinent facts in our memories. Marketers need to know how consumers learn in order to develop effective messages. Conditioning results in learning, and learned associations can generalize to other things. Learning can be accomplished through classical and instrumental conditioning and through observing the behavior of others. We use memory systems to store and retrieve information. Thank you for listening to the lecture of Consumer Behavior, Chapter 6, entitled Learning and Memory. I am Nancy Sutherland. I am eager to engage you.